Okay, thank you very much, Charlotte Ensemble. Let your lamp be trimmed and burning. A very good message for all of us. Welcome to all our guests today. We have 225, and uh, greetings to all our friends and brethren all around the world. We have 225 today, and of course that means that our average attendance has finally surpassed Kansas City. So we are number one congregation in attendance. Uh, Dr. Meredith has predicted this day, and it has finally come. Most of us have studied uh, Bible prophecy, and we're familiar with the term Armageddon. The Apostle John wrote in Revelation 16, 16, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Armageddon is a transliteration of the Hebrew Har Megiddo, or Har Magadon, which means the mountain or the hill of Megiddo. As you know, this is the gathering place for the world's armies that will gather to fight Christ at His coming. At the end of World War II, General Douglas MacArthur warned the world that we would face Armageddon if we could not find the way to peace. He visualized the terrible potential future of the world. On September 2, 1945, shortly after the unconditional surrender of Japan, General MacArthur said, quote, military alliances, balances of power, leagues of nations all in turn failed, leaving the only path to be the way of the crucible of war. The utter destructiveness of war now blocks out this alternative. We have had our last chance. If we will not devise some greater and more equitable system, our Armageddon will be at our door." He actually pronounced it Har Magadon, which is the Revised Standard Version translation of that scripture. General MacArthur was correct. The world will face Armageddon, or more precisely as it tells us in Revelation 16, 14, the kings of the earth gather against the God Almighty, they assemble to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So frequently it seems the word Armageddon is used these days in describing the dangers of our the recent trends, the dangers we face. The Thursday, Dr. Meredith taped his telecast titled, What is the World's Most Vital Need? How would you answer that question? He stated this on the telecast, quote, the answer is that the world's most vital and need right now is righteous government, end of quote. So think about that need, brethren. God is training us to fulfill that need. You want to see his previous telecast, you can see it on our website titled Blessings of Righteous Government. Referring to another type of Armageddon, Dr. Meredith made the final following statement in his telecast, quote, United States Senator Mark Warner says, we're approaching financial Armageddon. Senator Joe Machen declares that our natural, national debt and deficit are a fiscal titanic, end of quote. And just this past Wednesday, Weiss Research Incorporated held a briefing for its clients titled, America's Financial Armageddon survive and prosper. So brethren, even senators and concerned leaders realize that our world, and particularly the Western world, is headed for Judgment Day. So how are we, brethren, to live in these end times? Will we allow the stress, stresses and pressures of daily life to limit our growth and development? Or will we see the big picture that Dr. Meredith often stresses? We must continue to be doing God's work, growing and fulfilling our calling and our potential until the day we die. Let's all turn to Luke, the 12th chapter, verse 42, because Jesus instructs us to do exactly that. That is, we should never let down. We need to keep moving, growing, and developing. Luke, the 12th chapter, starting with verse 42. And the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his master will make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. 
More than 40 years ago, the church expected that Christ would come in 1975 and that the church would go to a place of safety in 1972. And as we came closer to 1972, some church members delayed going to the dentist. They neglected their educational opportunities, in essence, as they ceased to grow spiritually and even mentally. But Jesus expects that we will continue to develop, grow, and work toward the kingdom. He said, blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing. And so we need to always keep working, producing, and developing. God has a plan for all human beings, which we heard about in the sermonette. And we need to understand because God gives us the festivals and the holy days that describe that master plan. And he's given each of us incredible potential. We need to see what we can come to be. The title of the sermon is Your Incredible Human Potential. So let's first look at our calling in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26. Why hasn't God called the great of the world? 1 Corinthians 1 verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. God is not calling the great of the world. If you thought you were great, well then maybe you're not being called. But God is calling those whom He thinks will respond. And why does He call them? He continues here in verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. But of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So God has chosen you to demonstrate to the great of the world that he can work through common human beings and produce in them great potential and great character, godly character. Let's turn to Hebrews, the third chapter. So let's understand that we have a high calling from God. We have a great responsibility to fulfill that calling. Hebrews, the third chapter, and starting with verse 1. Hebrews 3 and verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. So you have a heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. So we have a heavenly calling, a high calling. And you know John 6, 44. Jesus said, No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. In a similar verse, of course, John 6, 65, where he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me, unless it has been granted to him by my Father. So if you are being called, you are very special. We heard that theme in the sermonette. So do you, brethren, see your calling? Do you see your potential? You know most of your potential and your calling and the responsibilities God is going to give you in the future, but let's review that in Revelation, the fifth chapter. Revelation 5 starting with verse 9. Revelation 5 and verse 9. Here again Jesus is taking the scroll in these mysterious seals that were unveiled. Revelation, the fifth chapter, starting with verse 9. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Now listen to this, out of every tribe and tongue or language and people and nation. 
So God is calling people from every language, every culture, every part of the world. And of course, we have uh, guests here from uh, down under. Uh, we heard uh, the opening prayer from an Aussie. And uh, next week, you'll hear a split sermon from an Aussie as well. But we have brethren from all over the world. Let's turn to Revelation, the first chapter. And here again, we find this calling emphasized. Revelation 1, verses 4 through 6. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. That's a guarantee. Christ is coming to this earth. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. We'll come back to that, but it's very important as we understand our future when we're born into the kingdom of God and how we're born into the kingdom of God. Christ was the firstborn, how? From the dead. And the ruler over the kings of the earth. He has all the authority. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And you can do a Bible study and find the many places where it shows that Christ loves us, that God loves us. And you find that so very reassuring, very comforting. Who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Verse 6, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Again, God calls us to be kings and priests, and He's also stated it in the past tense. He calls those things that are not as if they are, because He has a guarantee, and He has a calling for you. Well, God spoke to Moses and gave him ancient Israel's mission and calling. Let's turn back there to Exodus, the 19th chapter, Exodus 19. They were brought out of Egypt by miraculous signs and wonders, and the ten plagues that were brought upon Egypt. Then he brought them to Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, starting with verse 4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, God says to Moses, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, of course, on eagles' wings the, they walked. And if you read in Revelation, the twelfth chapter, about the church going into the wilderness, he uses a, a similar expression about eagle's wings. So maybe you'll be on a plane, maybe you'll walk. We'll see. Brought you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. The nation of Israel had that opportunity. They failed in that opportunity. So who has replaced Israel? Spiritual Israel. Can you think of yourself, can the church think of itself as a special treasure to God? Well, that's what you and I are. We are a special treasure. And you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So God gave them that opportunity, but they failed. And so we are that holy nation. He said, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And of course, several times, even during the, in the context of the clean and unclean meats in Leviticus uh, 11, uh, he says, be holy because I am holy. He told them to be holy. We are called to be a holy nation. I won't turn there, but as you know, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. Well, we might as well turn back there and, and take a look at that. It's a very important uh, section of Scripture regarding our calling and our identity of who we are. We need to always not forget who we are. I remember one minister of the Feast of Tabernacles years ago. I would think that was the feast in... Uh, St. Pete, Petersburg, Florida, 1977. It said, Jesus never forgot who he was. He knew his calling. He knew who, what his mission was. And so we need to always remember that as well. First Peter, the second chapter, and verse 9. But you are a chosen generation and a royal priesthood. Again, combining 
the kings and priests together. It's a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. We're also called the people of God and a holy nation. So God is training kings and priests and a holy nation. He's also called us to, to judge righteous judgment. And you've heard uh, that scripture quoted often, but 1 uh, Corinthians, the sixth chapter and verse 2. Do you not know the saints will judge the world? So think of your calling as kings, priests, and judges for the future. And have you accepted that calling? Will you fulfill that calling? God's kingdom of servants will govern and serve the whole world. So let's take a look briefly at the future potential of God's government. We know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be close to God in authority in the millennium and when God's kingdom comes on this earth. How do we know that? Because six times in the New Testament, uh, God is called the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, that is the God of A Isaac and the God of Jacob. I'll just read one example here for you, Matthew 22, verses 31. Uh, Jesus said, But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? So if God uses the patriarchs' names, Obviously, they're going to have a very high position in the kingdom of God. Jesus went on to say, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He was emphasizing the resurrection. And of course, in the future, we know that King David will rule over the combined nations of Israel and Judah. They'll become one stick. Uh, that's mentioned, of course, in Ezekiel 34 and Ezekiel 37. And we know that the 12 apostles will rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. That's in Matthew 9, verses 28. So again, just imagine fellowshipping with the great patriarchs, the apostles, and the saints. You may have quite a few questions for King David, or the Apostle Paul, or Noah, or Job, or any of the patriarchs, or Sarah, or Esther, or those who were faithful. So try to imagine what will be like fellowshipping in the future and of course, we look forward to being reunited with our loved ones who are deceased. In the World Ahead booklet, and I encourage you as you think about your future potential, uh, the world ahead, what will it be like? Uh, pages 34 and 35, uh, Dr. Meredith writes this. In that magnificent future, soon to be established at Christ's coming, we will all be able to fellowship and interact with the greatest leaders of the Bible and many other such faithful servants, the spirits of just men made perfect now and forever. Many of those, of course, who are sleeping in the grave, uh, sleeping in Jesus, of course, are those spirits of just men and women made perfect. And in that blessed role, we will have the wonderful opportunity to share the very love of God, the wisdom of God, and the outflowing concern of God with those people who live on through the millennium. May God grant this to be your future. May God help all of us to grasp His truly awesome purpose for our lives. And may God help each of us to go all out to do our part in preparing for a place of love and service in the very real world ahead. So again, uh, brethren, if you haven't read The World Ahead, What Will It Be Like recently? I encourage you to do that. And of course in that very role we will have the opportunity to serve as spirit beings and be able to be much more effective than we are now. We need to see our real potential. Proverbs 29, 18 in the King James Version said where there is no vision the people perish. But of course in the New King James Version it is where there is no revelation the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. So you need to keep God's commandments at the same time 
think about the revelation that God has given you because He's giving it to you where many people don't understand their calling. They don't see the future and the real world ahead. The NIV says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keeps the law, happy is he. So what will be your role in tomorrow's world, in the kingdom of God? There are many possibilities. Let's turn to one in Revelation, the second chapter. We've seen this on the telecast and heard it in sermons. Revelation 2, and verse 26. And remember that the message to the seven churches requires that we listen to the message of every one of those churches. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus gives that message after every one of the seven churches. In Revelation 2, verse 26, he says, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So one possibility is to be ruling over nations. Can you imagine yourself or picture yourself ruling over any nations? And of course, uh, father and mother who have several children running around there, they're uh, ruling over uh, potential nations right there. What other possibilities are there for your future? Well, Revelation 3, verse 11. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast that you, what you have, that no one may take your crown. Again, you have to, as we heard in the special ensemble music, keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Hold fast that you have. Don't be deceived by false doctrines that come along. He who overcomes, verse 12, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go, no more, go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. One other possibility is to be right at the headquarters, to be a pillar in the very temple of God. As you read later back in Revelation 21 or 22, there is no temple because it says God and the Lamb are the temple. So if you're a pillar in the temple of God, you have an intimate relationship with God the Father. And of course, the New Jerusalem is going to be the headquarters of the whole universe. And what is that New Jerusalem called? It's called the Bride of the Lamb. So those who are in the first resurrection will dwell in the New Jerusalem that comes down from God out of heaven. Yes, you might be there at very headquarters, or you might be ruling nations. And ultimately, as I said, those in the first resurrection will dwell with God the Father in the New Jerusalem. And that's in Revelation 21, verse 9, where he says, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife, referring to the New Jerusalem. So I hope you're beginning to see your incredible human potential if you haven't already. Perhaps you have the potential of ruling over cities instead of nations. But then we have to ask, are you ruling yourself well? Are you a faithful steward over your possessions? Let's turn to Luke, the 19th chapter. Luke 19, uh, verse 11. Here we have the parable of the miners, my, the miners, uh, mina, minas, it's my New England accent, minas, M-I-N-A-S, verse 11, Luke 19. Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable, because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. And so he talks about the nobleman who went to a far country and then to return. Then to verse 15. And so it was when they returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given money to be called to him that he might know how much each man had gained by trading. In other words, we have to keep busy. We just can't rest on our oars, so to speak. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. 
because you are faithful in a very little. Now some of us think that we have so much to be responsible for we can't make it. And yet God says He's faithful in very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. And then another came, Master, here's your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. And of course, that particular person would receive the greatest penalty of all. He said, why didn't you even put it with the... Um, the bank that I might have come with collected it with interest in verse 23. So you may have the potential if you're faithful over very little of ruling over ten cities or over five cities. So we see our calling, we're in training for the future. But are we also fulfilling not only potential for the future but what we can actually accomplish in this day and age? Jesus lived for just 33 and a half years. And he finished the work that God gave him to accomplish. And of course we are preaching the gospel of the kingdom as a witness to the nations. We're feeding the flock. We're giving the Ezekiel warning to warn the western nations and the world of what's going to come. But we have to continue to grow spiritually. How? As you know by doing God's work. That it isn't a selfish salvation as our former association began to uh, apostatize too. But let's contrast that with those who have little or no opportunity. Uh, Luke the 12th chapter, back up again in Luke 12 and verse 48. He says that we have a greater responsibility for everyone to whom much is given. In the middle of verse 48, Luke 12, for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required and to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. And of course, as uh, some of the management's books uh, pointed out, if you want to get something done, give it to a busy man, because he can get it done. But to whom much is given, much is required. Now we think of those who have died in their youth. Think of children, teenagers, military soldiers and those who have died in their teenage and we think what happened to them? They weren't able to fulfill their potential. Maybe some of them could have become architects or engineers or artists or writers or scientists of some sort. And yet they were cut off in life at an early life. But what will happen to them? Of course they will have their opportunity in the white throne judgment. How can we develop our potential even now? Oh, at the uh, Living Youth Camp we've been teaching from time to time the seven laws of success. I know one person said, why do I need to know the seven laws of success? Well, of course, if you want to be trained, you want to learn something, you want to uh, grow, you want to start applying those. And sometimes I, I have to look back and ask myself, am I still applying the seven laws of success? How many of you can name all seven? Let me see your hands. Okay, two. All right, five. Good. We got six people out of 225 that can name the seven laws of success. Well, we, we taught that to the Living Youth Camp and the Summer Educational Program back in worldwide in the 1980s. And I've had uh, those campers who've grown up now and become successful and said those seven laws of success really helped. Of course, number one is to fix the right goal. You need to know where you're going. Matthew 6.33 gives us that goal to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, His way of living, to recapture those true values and to follow and live by the spiritual application of the Ten Commandments as well as the statutes and the judgments. And the second law of success, of course, is preparation or education. They're still helpful. To, as you heard in the announcements, Monday we will have 10 Living University graduates. Uh, six are, will be here uh, for the graduation ceremonies. Four will receive their certificates or degrees in abstention. Are you still educating yourself? Are you still learning? Are you still challenging your brain and your mind? How many of you have studied at least one lesson 
of Tomorrow's World Bible Study Course. Let me see your hands. Oh, excellent. At least one. That looks like about 91.3%. Excellent. Oh, but you need to, of course, study more than just one lesson. I was just studying a lesson recently and profited from it. Of course, in the editorial department, we read every word virtually of all of our publications. So we've gone over the Tomorrow's World Bible Study course and all of the magazines and all of the booklets. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And so we have those people who want to go after, as it's called, itching ears. Uh, as he says here in uh, chapter 4, verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itch, itching ears. It's a funny expression. Itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And that's been happening, still continues to happen. And some of you may fall into that trap. And we warn you continually, don't do that. Stick to the trunk of the tree. Read your own Bible. Prove to yourself what is right and true and good. Ministers, of course, need to fulfill their responsibility. As it tells us here in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. It's a very powerful introduction that Paul gives to Timothy. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. In the King James doctrine, long-suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. You know, at the, uh, one of the TWSPs I gave uh, in California, one man came up and uh, after I'd given the presentation, he said, uh, you know, I, I know, uh, I know the beast's name. And, uh, oh, you do, you know. I says, well, uh, and uh, he went, and I want to tell you something else. I said, no, you're wrong. He said, oh, you're not going to receive the anointed word. I said, no, I'm not going to receive your word. So he left. He didn't know who the beast was. He thought he had the answers to all the questions in prophecy. He was a false prophet. I didn't let him get beyond first base. But there are many like that in this end time. One California group of rapturists predicts that God would bring, will bring Judgment Day on May 21st, 2011. That's one week from today. And 200 million people are supposed to be raptured into heaven. So watch out. One week from today, you may be left behind. <laughs> and you better wish that you will be left behind. And of course, 200 million people are not going to be raptured then. The the prophecy also is, says that from that date, six months of death, devastation are going to occur until the ultimate end of the world, October 21st, 2011. Well, the atheists in California really took notice of this, and they put this huge billboard out on Interstate 80. My wife and I saw it on our way from the San Francisco airport to Concord. Uh, the atheists uh, ridiculed the rapturists with a message on this large California billboard at the cost of $27,000 for five weeks. Of course, many thousands of cars and vehicles passed that billboard. The billboard read, quote, The rapture, you know it's nonsense, 2,000 years of any day now. And of course, the atheists also are planning parties for May 21st and May 22nd to celebrate the failure of the rapture prediction. Well, as I said on the telecast that I taped this last uh, Thursday, I said my wife and I saw this atheist-sponsored billboard in San Francisco. The word nonsense dominated the message. Yes, there is a plethora of nonsense, both in the religious world and the atheist world. I encourage you to search the keywords evolution or atheist or rapture on our Tomorrow's World website. You can learn their errors and non-biblical ideas by accessing our previous telecasts as well as magazine articles and commentaries on these and other subjects. 
So again, God says in Romans 1 and verse 20 that those who deny him are without excuse. So those atheists who are ridiculing the rapturists are correct in their ridicule, but they are wrong in their denial that Christ is going to come back. Their denial, of course, of the existence of Christ. In his booklet, Your Ultimate Destiny, Dr. Meredith writes about a purpose for humanity's creation. He challenges evolutionists with this comment, quote, some intelligent, educated individuals prefer to be politically correct and subscribe to the evolutionary theory that your mind, with a complexity far surpassing any watch or computer ever designed and produced, somehow came together with your body as an accident of the evolutionary process. If you believe that, you had better stop reading right here, because until God himself wakes you up, you are not going to understand anything about your ultimate destiny or any other spiritual thing. As it is written, the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible, Hebrews 11 and verse 3. Yes, those who deny God are without excuse, Romans 1.20. There is a judgment day coming, but it will not be on May 21st, 2011. Let's turn to Romans, the second chapter, and, and verse 5, Romans 2, and verse 5. No, we are already under judgment, as you know, it tells us in 1 Peter 4, verse 17. The judgment must begin with the house of God, so all of us are under judgment, but that process does not have to be an intimidating process. It's a process that we can have the faith and the confidence that we, as we grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, that God will complete what He started in us. It tells us in Philippians 1 and verse 6. Romans, the second chapter, and starting with verse 5, again, he's discussing God's gift of repentance in verse 4, and then verse 5, Romans 2. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life, listen to this because this applies to us, eternal to life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. That's our calling. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, obedience is required, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So again, we see there is a day of judgment but God has a high calling and a wonderful potential for us. Let's turn to 2 Peter 3, verse 18. Of course, it's a common scripture that most of us have read over and over again. But again, how well are we living? 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. 2 Peter 3, verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. The world's plan of salvation just looks at the sacrifice of Christ and thinks that's it. Once saved, always saved. But the false application of that doctrine denies the matter that you need to grow. And that's why the days of love and bread show that we need to replace the leaven of malice and wickedness with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. We replace human nature with divine nature, with God's nature. And He creates that in us with our cooperation. So again, we need to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. There are many ways of doing that. And of course, the second law of success of preparation and education is one of those ways. And how many of you uh, are too old to learn? Any of you too old to learn? It appears that the world's oldest Bachelor of Arts recipient was 95-year-old Kansas resident Nola Oaks. I wonder if she's related to uh, Grandma McNair, who in 2007 earned a bachelor's degree in general studies with emphasis in history from Fort Hayes State University. Oaks went on to complete her master's degree in 2010 at age 98. She got her master's degree. 
So if any of you feel you're too old you know, to learn, uh, here's an example you should consider. By doing so, she surpassed the previous record holder, Chao Mu He, who at age 96 received his Master of Arts in Philosophy from Nanhua University in Taiwan. And according to the Guinness Book of Records, the oldest PhD recipient is a German man, Dr. Heinz Wanderoth, Wenderoth, who at age 97 received his doctorate from Leibniz University of Hanover in 2008. The subject of his doctoral dissertation was, quote, cell biological studies in the morphology, morphology and physiology of primitive marine placozoons, trichoplax adrahens. So he was using his mind even at that age. We're never too old to learn. And of course, in our today's church bulletin, we have the commentary from our CAD director on the need for wisdom. You know all that, Proverbs 9, 7, the fear of the eternal is the beginning of wisdom. And Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the eternal is the beginning of knowledge. And so in having that, that reverence and that reality of who and what God is, don't ask, raise your hands, but I'll just ask you, you know, as he says there in Isaiah 66, 2, to this man will I look to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. Have any of you, how many of you have in your own heart and mind ever trembled before God? Ever trembled before the word of God? Think about it. Because that's the beginning of wisdom, beginning of knowledge. That's the one to whom God looks. That's how you start to fulfill your calling and broaden your horizons. I've encouraged students over the years to broaden their horizons. Sometimes we get fixated on little small routines and areas and we need to spread out. Well, of course, God helps us to do that by telling us to go to where he's placed his name at the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, my first trip was from uh, Norfolk, uh, Virginia to Big Sandy, Texas, my, my first feast. It was quite, a, quite an adventure. It broadened my horizons. And uh, some of you, how many of you are going to Jamaica this year for the feast? Anyone? Okay, good, a handful, quite a few. And uh, how many are going to other Caribbean uh, feast sites? Good, a few over there. Of course, Dr. And Mrs. Pierre, and uh, of course, uh, Dr. Scott Winnell and his family. So that broadens our horizons. It always does. And of course, another way of broadening our horizons, if you can see the heavens, which in most places you can't because of light pollution, where our God says in Isaiah 40, lift up your eyes on high and behold all these things. Who's created all these galaxies and stars and calls them by name, each one? Of all the 100 billion galaxies and the, uh, they used to say 100 billion stars, but they've increased that way beyond the 100 billion stars for each of the 100 billion galaxies now. So we need to learn something new. And uh, of course, our office staff uh, recently uh, inst in installed a table tennis uh, table. And so some of our employees are learning something new. They're learning table tennis. And uh, at the picnic tomorrow, some of our men are expanding their horizons by the men's cake baking contest. And we'll see how well they've expanded their horizons. Uh, Mr. League uh, wanted me to broaden my horizons by playing four chess players at the same time. I don't know that I'll accept that challenge. We'll see. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, we have the Singles Day, uh, Singles Weekend, the Memorial Day weekend. and. Uh, Part of that is hiking at Crowder Mountain. I was just asking uh, the leaders ahead of time, and they have chosen two easy trails and two moderate trails, uh, hiking at Crowder Mountain. I thought, well, this is a younger generation. Um, they don't really take the challenge that we did, but of course, they have to come back and listen to a lecture by me and Dr. Meredith later on. So maybe that's why they're taking just the easy and moderate trails and not the challenging ones. But, you know, my wife and I uh, had the privilege of climbing Mount Sinai with um, ambassador students back in the summer of 19, 1984. And uh, 
that was quite a privilege. We started at 3.30 in the morning and in the dark went up switchback trails to the top of Mount Sinai and got there just at 6 o'clock in the morning just as the sun was rising. We've had quite a few here in our audience who've climbed mountains. Uh, Dr. Meredith has climbed uh, Mount Whitney, which is the tallest mountain in California, 14,508 feet. And of course, there are other mountain climbers. I don't know anyone who has surpassed Mr. Wayne Pyle, who's climbed 62 mountains in the San Diego area and climbed Mount Whitney not just once, but seven times. So you can talk to him about his experience. But I hope, brethren, that we can understand that we need to take challenges. We need to broaden our horizons. I actually uh, uh, went up the Washington Monument. That was 1959. Uh, it was 52 years ago. I decided that it would be easier to walk down the Washington Monument steps rather than climbing up. So I took the elevator to the top of the Washington Monument, which is 550 feet high, and decided I will walk down. There are 889 stairs walking down. It would have been easier, I think, for me to walk up. As I looked down, it looked like a bottomless abyss. There didn't seem to be an end to where I was going. But again, uh, do you broaden your horizons? Uh, Mr. Bill Bomer worked on the 48th floor of the San Juan building in Los Angeles. And on several occasions, he had to walk down the stairs during an annual fire drill or when the elevator wasn't working. You imagine, and I remember taking my, my mother and mother-in-law to a, a hotel during uh, the Feast of Tabernacles up in the 16th floor. We were down in the pool the time a fire alarm went off. And I thought, oh, how, how would this work if a fire alarm goes off? You can't take the elevator. I've got to take my, my mother and mother-in-law down the 16 flights of stairs. So something to think about. My office right now is on the first floor, by the way. You say uh, Mr. Bomer, when he was there on the 48th floor, could look out of his office and see helicopters flying below him. It uh, seemed to accentuate the height of his office. So I want to encourage you to try something new that's godly, to plant a vegetable or a flower garden, to try a new recipe, or take an art class, or learn basic astronomy. Can you find the North Star? Mr. Tyler will find that difficult in the Southern Hemisphere. but. We can do things like taking up oil painting or, or photography. So there are so many dimensions to our great potential. One, of course, is our great family potential. Let's turn to Ephesians, the third chapter, Ephesians 3. So I hope that you will never stop learning, that you will broaden your horizons, develop skills. God has given us all different talents and abilities. Have you recognized them? Have you developed any of them? Ephesians 3. In verse 14, the Apostle Paul writes, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. God is building a family, and you are his sons and daughters. He goes on to say that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ. We already commented on that earlier. Which pass passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You have incredible human potential. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. I've given you examples of claiming that promise before. You know, there's nothing impossible for God. You think big, you pray big, you ask God, of course, that His will be done in His time and His way when you make your requests. But realize He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we think. Or ask, according to the power that works in us, to Him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ, by Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. We read earlier, of course, that Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. So how are we born again? Let's turn to that in Romans, the first chapter. Romans 1. God is creating a family, and that's our incredible 
family potential. Romans 1 and verse 4. Speaking of Christ who is born of the seed of David according to the flesh. And how was he declared to be the Son of God? Verse 4, Romans 1. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. How? By the resurrection from the dead. We saw that in Revelation 1 verse 4 that he's the firstborn from the dead. Let's turn to Romans the 8th chapter, Romans 8. And here we find he's the firstborn of many brethren. So God is creating a fantastic, loving, glorious family. And you and I are called to that potential and to that wonderful calling. Romans the 8th chapter, and of course this is a, one of the premier chapters in the Bible, the Holy Spirit chapter, time you need to take time to read it, read it slowly, and think about each of the verses. Romans 8 and verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Now, actually, God commands us to love Him, but He also gives us myriads and multiple reasons why we love Him. We love Him because He first loved us. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we find two major principles here. One, Christ is the firstborn of that family. And we're born into the family the same way he was, by a resurrection from the dead. Or if we're alive at that twinkling of an eye at the last trump, as it says in 1 Corinthians the 15th chapter and 1 Thessalonians 4. We also must be conformed to His image, which means we need to be like Him. We need to have His mind. We need to think like He thinks. We need to have His nature. We heard about the first fruits in the sermonette today. That's our calling, to be a part of that awesome family. Mr. Herbert Armstrong wrote a book called The Incredible Human Potential. It was uh, published in 1978. Uh, by the way, you can uh, get this on Amazon.com. I think there are 16 uh, used copies for $4.75 and a brand new copy for $57. But uh, it's available. Mr. Armstrong wrote in page 68, What a marvelous plan God conceived. He would form man of physical matter, so that if man totally failed, he could be as though he had never been. So God made man of physical substance, formed and shaped like God, so that man could be converted, changed from matter into spirit composition at a resurrection, a spirit-composed member of the God family. Can your mind grasp, Mr. Armstrong writes, what matchless wisdom, power of designing and planning, made our transcendent human potential possible? End of quote. Let's turn to Hebrews, the second chapter, Hebrews 2. Yes, it's an awesome plan that God has, and He's revealed that to us through His Spirit. Hebrews, the second chapter, take another perspective of our family. Hebrews 2 and verse 10. Speaking of Christ, for it is fitting for Him, Jesus Christ, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation, talking about God the Father, bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call you and me a brother or a sister. And he gives the example, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. So again, we find the quote that the Logos, the one who became the Messiah, is not ashamed to call us brethren. And he gives this remarkable example in Matthew the 12th chapter, showing that family relationship. Matthew the 12th chapter, starting in verse 46. Jesus' mother and brothers send for him, is the title here, subtitle. Verse 46, Matthew 12. 
When he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Jesus had brothers. Then one said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. Verse 48, But he answered and said to them, said to the one who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. What an awesome statement that is. Again, it's a confirmation time and time and time again of God the Father's love for you and Christ's love for you. That he would even call you his mother. If you're a woman who is doing the will of God the Father in heaven. And of course that's what we need to do is to seek God's will above all else in our prayers, in our actions, in our deeds, in our thoughts. Are you seeking God's will or are you seeking your own will? We have a sermon in our library, number 109, self-will or God's will. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And we have brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world. As we read earlier from the Song of the Saints in Revelation 5, 9, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. We recently received the uh, Austra Australasian news update. Mr. Bruce Tyler is here with us today. And I'll make this copy available to you. But it gives us a perspective of our family around the world. Let me just read to you some of the titles here. I'd love to read to you some of the uh, stories and examples of uh, the work that's gone on in Australasia, Adelaide ordination, Melbourne uh, baptisms, um, Papua New Guinea update, and Weewak, Maprick, and also Port Moresby, where uh, some were baptized by Mr. Hemphill. Uh, we have brethren scattered all over the world. Colombo's Sri Lanka update by uh, Zig Zal Zalde. An India update by Rajan Moses, who baptized 10 people in his trip to India. Malaysia uh, update, and uh, Philippines update, uh, Philippine baptisms. A night to be much observed. But I want to take a little time to read one little section here about someone who is fulfilling his current potential. He's a 20-year-old Filipino young man who was involved with uh, a youth uh, program sponsored by the United Nations. His father, Arnel Angos, uh, mentions this. At the conference, Arnel, his son, 20-year-old son, was chosen to speak for the Philippine delegation before the more than 1,000 youth delegates from all over the world. This conference was in Thailand. Onel spoke about the only way peace could be attained among nations. In general, understandable terms, he spoke elaborating the real cause of why long-lasting peace is not yet possible, citing the teachings of Mr. Armstrong, which is from the Bible. He also cited General Douglas MacArthur's famous speech about saving the flesh. He said that he was requested now that Onel, as a result of that conference, was requested by the UN Secretariat to write a short essay about the same subject he spoke at the conference. Then immediately after submitting that essay, the United Nations recommended him, that is Onel, uh, that is the 20-year-old Filipino young man, recommended him for the official United Nations Ambassador for Peace. He was asked to participate in the mandatory week-long UN workshop to be held beginning March 28th in Cambodia. Now this is interesting. And together with other UN Youth Peace Adv Ambassadors, Onel is also assigned to organize next year's UN Youth Conference in the Philippines to be attended by 1,500 delegates from all over the world. So here's a young man who's now been given a responsibility to organize the UN Youth Conference in the Philippines next year. I'll just read one excerpt from his, uh, it's just a wonderful essay, you can read it, I'll leave it out here on the information table, but I'll read a couple paragraphs from his essay. Talking about the conference uh, that he attended, these conflicts cannot go on forever. Speaking of world conflicts, 
But if it does, they shall eventually culminate in wiping out humanity on this planet unless a, quote, strong hand from someplace, end of quote, intervenes. In the same conference on L rights, we were asked to present our opinion on how we can achieve peace. In my presentation, I outlined the wisdom of the late General Douglas MacArthur. He once said that if we are to save humanity, it must be of the spirit that must be changed. History proved and are continually proving that all of these peace treaties will come to nothing, but will just serve as temporary solution to a very big problem. If we will not address the root cause of these conflicts, what is that root cause? I believe it is human character. It is very important for the United Nations to start tackling the problem from this vantage point. Resources are wasted and will continue to be sucked into the black hole of incorrect solutions as long as the real issue is not being addressed. What then do I propose? Human character is largely defined by the factors that surround making choices. We can't force someone to make a choice. It is an insult to the free moral agency of humans. But we can make them see the true perspective behind every choice that will eventually be made. We should start with education. Start with true education. So again, a very remarkable essay and also a development of his potential on El Ancos, A-N-G-C-O-S, and his first name is A-U-N-E-L-L. So we have brethren all over the world, and that's our family. And I hope, brethren, that you have that big picture, that you can think about our brethren in South America, in South Africa, and of course even in Eastern uh, Europe, and uh, in the Philippines, and in other areas of Asia, all over the world. We have a sermon number 307, Into All the World. We have to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. We have to set that example of being loving, and having the Christ-like nature. Let's turn to 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, 1 Peter 4. I referred to this before about our being under judgment. 1 Peter 4, verse 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Again, obedience keeps coming up, and all these prodders will say, oh, no, if you, you feel you have to obey the commandments, that's salvation by works. That's a horrendous false argument. He goes on to say here then in verse 18, Now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as unto a faithful creator. And that's part of our faith. We ask God, as it says in Psalm 51.10, create in me a clean heart, O God. And we trust that God is doing that, even as we experience trials and tests, even as we experience suffering, even as we experience health problems. We know that God has a purpose and that he's creating in us the masterpiece of his creation, which is perfect, righteous, godly, holy character. The NIV says says it this way, states it this way, so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. So even if you are suffering, you still try to serve and help and have that outgoing concern. And how many of us have visited people suffering in the hospital and found we went there to encourage them, but they were so outgoing they encouraged us instead, even though they were suffering. They continued to do good. So let's remember our family around the world and pray daily for them. And let's fulfill our great family potential. God is giving us an inheritance. And the inheritance, as you know, of course, according to Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But let's turn to Romans, the eighth chapter. And again, see this awesome family gift that God gives us and the promise that he gives us in Romans the 8th chapter that however to describe this pinnacle of inspiring chapters in the Bible, Romans 8 
starting with verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So do you ask God to lead you by His Spirit each day? For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom, by which should be, we cry out, Abba, Father. That very personal relationship. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together with Him. So we have an inheritance. We are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. We inherit the earth. We also, I won't turn there, but inherit eternal life. That's in Matthew 19, verse 29, where he says, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. We also inherit the kingdom of God. As it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Turn to Revelation 21 and verse 7. Revelation 21 and verse 7. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. There are requirements, of course, of faithfulness, of obedience, of developing our potential, of growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Revelation 21. And again, very inspiring to see the end of the story as you read these last two chapters in the book of Revelation. Revelation 21, verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. As we've already explained in Hebrews, the second chapter, that he's put everything under mankind's feet, yet not yet. And so we realize that we will inherit not only the earth, not only eternal life, not only the kingdom of God, not only the new Jerusalem when it comes down from God out of heaven, but we inherit all things. We'll inherit the universe. Nothing will be within, without our access. We'll be able to go instantaneously to the farthest galaxy because we'll be in a different dimension that is not limited by time and space. So God has called us to an awesome inheritance and of course the requirement is that we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. He says that we need to see our calling and to fulfill that calling. Galatians 5, verse 22, of course, shows us how as we look forward to the Feast of Pentecost when we know that God will fill us with, as He did anciently, fill those on the day of Pentecost with His Spirit and tells us even now, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So God tells us that you and I right now should be filled with the Spirit. That's His instruction. So ask Him that you can be filled with the Spirit and that we're producing just as a garden produces its fruit. The verse 22 of Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, they're called gentlemen, self-control, against such there is no law. So again, brethren, we need to produce that fruit. God has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. We have the power to overcome. We have the power to grow. We have the power to fulfill our potential. Remember Philippians 4, verse 13. The Apostle Paul boldly stated, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We cannot let down, we cannot become slothful, self-satisfied, or Laodicean. And Jesus said, blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. The world needs righteous government, and Christ is training us to be kings, priests, and judges. 
So let's go all, let's every one of us go all out in growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Let's expand our horizons. Let's develop our talents. Let's fulfill our calling, our ultimate destiny, and our incredible human potential.